uh, Morgan Hill Chamber of Commerce Economic Development Committee. Um, today, we're going to have a session on the lane reduction and beautification project in Morgan Hill uh, with the city making a presentation. Um, first, I'd like to go around the virtual table here and have everybody introduce themselves, all the panelists. Uh, my name is Rick Kent. I'm the chair of the Economic Development Committee for the Chamber. Steve? Hi, I'm Steve Tate. I am a retired guy and a chamber ambassador. Matt? You're mute, Matt. You're muted, Matt. How's that? Better. Better. <laughs> it's my first time on Zoom. <laughs> uh, Matt Mayhood, I'm the economic development director with the city of Morgan Hill. And um, instead of doing a self introduction, I want to introduce uh, Travers Grindall who's with us down here uh, this morning joining us. He is our new economic development fellow uh, and just joined us on Monday. And uh, what better way to get onboarded than to uh, join a chamber EDC meeting and get an update on the Monterey Street um, lane reduction project. So welcome, Trevor. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me, everybody. Hey, Mario. Uh, Mario Banuelos, I'm a Rotarian and also the chair of a small business training program with Rotary. Steve? Steve McFarland, CEO, Better Business Bureau. Brittany? Good morning, everyone. Brittany Sherman, Economic Development Coordinator for the City of Morgan Hill. Alex? Hi, good morning. Uh, Merry, Merry Christmas coming up. I'm Alex Kennett. I'm a local uh, realtor, residential and commercial, and a director of the Open Space Authority. Armando? Good morning. Armando Garcia, board chair, Morgan Hill Chamber of Commerce. And I think I'll go for John, even though it sound, looks like it's Nick. Sorry, I, I can't change the name. I just yeah. tried. But uh, yeah, good morning, everyone, and happy holidays. John McKay, um, currently in the last two weeks of being May Pro Tem of the city of Morgan Hill. And Nick? Hey, good morning, gang. This is Nick H., President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. And guys, I'm having internet issues here. So if you lose me, it's not that I don't love you. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Lori? Hi, Lori Allen, the Director of Programs and Communications at the Morgan Hill Chamber of Commerce. And lastly, Marby. I can, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning, Marby Lee, um, realtor here in Morgan Hill. Great. And with that, why don't we launch into our presentation? Matt, do you want to take the floor? Yeah, thank you, uh, Rick. Appreciate it. I'm going to um, share my screen and uh, what I'm going to do. The host has disabled participant screen sharing. So Lori, if you can help me out. I could probably talk through the entire presentation, but that wouldn't be nearly as fun. <laughs> You're good now, Matt. Okay. And what are you guys seeing? Are you guys seeing a full screen? Yes. Yes. Are you still seeing a full screen of the presentation? Yes. All right. Great. It's um, I'm using two screens, so sometimes it gets a little confusing. So good morning, everybody. Uh, Matt Mayhood, Economic Development Director, City of Morgan Hill. What I'm going to do this morning is give you the 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 same presentation I've given to the downtown Morgan Hill downtown restaurant uh, group, um, and this is really a culmination of the presentations we've given. Um, to the work group, the working group, and um, being consistent, just sharing the same information over and over again. You do have the benefit. Um, this is, it's an updated presentation from the last working group meeting. So you do get a, a couple of additional slides in here as well uh, towards the end. Um, so the objective of the entire uh, project um, and the working group and the and the lane reduction program has really been to, at the direction of city council, to develop a recommendation for how to best implement the lane reduction and place branding beautification project. 
So this project is already approved by the city council and its staff has just been working on how to best implement the project moving forward. Uh, the lane reduction um, program, um, this is really the guiding principles that we were working under. Um, prote protects pedestrians, creates community space, supports business recovery, supports emergency response, minimize congestion, create opportunities for diversity, equity, inclusion, close gaps in the fabric and retain parking when possible. Um, here are some of those things, uh, the action items that we believe um, when we were walking into this process, uh, address some of these guiding principles. So uh, have a protected multimodal lane, uh, <coughs> open and available parklets, uh, support business recovery by having dedicated parklet, parklets, mountable features uh, when you do the lane reduction, minimize traffic congestion, which be signal, signal improvements, um, and there's other things in there. DEI, um, really open parklets, invite street vendors in, and we're trying to figure out how to do a community parklet. Close gaps in the fa fabric, um, activated parklets. Uh, there's longer term development to be done in the downtown and then retain parking. Really look at parking spaces where parklets aren't needed and just look at parking overall uh, usage in the downtown. So we really put together um, several processes. So where we culminated to um, in the working group four meeting really was findings from the downtown parking survey uh, that was conducted uh, from business visits, myself and um, Hillary Holman actually walked businesses uh, before the working group started meeting and talked to them about how they were using parklets, how they wouldn't use parklets, uh, what are their needs for long-term parking, short-term parking, um, what are the other issues that they see in downtown. So we did some actual business visits walking the Monterey corridor. We didn't go off the Monterey corridor. Uh, there's been four working group meetings originally scheduled at three and we added a fourth because we felt like we needed another opportunity to really talk as a group. We did a downtown residence pizza night at the community center, very well attended, great input where we asked our community really what's working downtown, what's not working and what, what opportunities exist. Um, and then we did two town hall walking tour meetings. We did one on a Saturday, on a Saturday morning and we had about 20 folks show up for that. And we did a whole downtown walking tour and then we did one on a, I think it was a Thursday night, um, and we all started at the ice cream shop and then did a little walking tour of downtown as well, led by Edith Ramirez. In addition, we've done a uh, chamber meeting, downtown association, and the downtown restaurant meetings. So the concerns that we've heard, um, obviously we've heard concerns about traffic impact. We've heard concerns about loss of parking, noise, homelessness, uh, the need to slow down traffic, lighting issues, uh, not necessarily on the Monterey corridor, but also uh, on side streets and on Depot Street. Uh, sidewalks, where there's uneven sidewalks and obstacles in the sidewalk or narrow sidewalks, um, obstacles in the sidewalk. Uh, the need for more enforcement in the downtown corridor, uh, whether it's for speeding, um, for just general things that are happening in downtown, uh, more retail and activation. So how do you create more activity in downtown? How do you support more retail uh, and support the retail that exists? And just the general aesthetics of downtown. How do you make it cleaner, cleaner and safer and friendlier? Uh, which leads to the question just of the lack of maintenance, the lack of ongoing maintenance and who's responsible uh, for uh, maintaining the sidewalks and just the general cleanliness of downtown. We heard the needs and the, needs and the wants of the group, um, a lot of demand for short-term parking, and this was really for short-term parking um, closer to restaurants, closer to retail, um, not just for, well, first of all, the, the, the request came in around the need for restaurant takeout and the DoorDash and the Grubhub so an opportunity for them to park close to the restaurant so they could drive in, grab the 
the, the meal and, and leave quickly. But then as the process developed, we also heard short-term parking for drop-off and pickup of people near restaurants. Um, we heard the need and want to slow down traffic um, around and on Monterey. We heard the need and want for more enforcement uh, to, you know, around noise, around speeding, um, around parking issues, uh, just in general, more enforcement. Uh, more retail downtown. Uh, it's a, that's a challenge for us. We feel like we got a good, uh, strong restaurant community, but not enough retail. We don't quite have the density that we want around retail that makes downtown like the shopping district that you think of to go to. Um, the challenge with that, not to get into the challenges necessarily, but we just don't have a lot of vacant space in downtown or uh, just to add retail. Community space, the need and want for community activations uh, for people to gather. Um, other activations, so places for people to gather, for uh, pop-up things to occur, um, like sidewalk Saturdays that we have on 3rd Street, other activations just that bring people out. And then parklets, how are they affordable and consistent? Right now, there is uh, a lack of consistency in the parklets, and we can be pretty frank, they're not affordable. And moving forward, they're probably not going to be affordable, uh, but that's one of the, the needs and the wants. And then obviously, pedestrian and bike safety is key. That's in part why we're here uh, and having this conversation. Everybody wants a safe and clean place to, to gather. And then lastly, improve access to downtown. And that conversation came up a lot around the, if you do the lane reduction in downtown, how do you improve access for pedestrians actually to get to downtown or for bicyclists to actually get to downtown because the pathways leading to downtown need to be accessible as well. Create more parking. Um, that was a conversation we heard over and over again. Um, we'll talk more about parking in a bit. Add accessible parking. And when we mean accessible parking, we mean ADA or handicap parking. Um, there are a few handicap parking spots in downtown, but they're mostly on the south side, uh, not on the north side. And then the need or the want for a business improvement district, a uh, property business improvement district, which is a self-assessment by the property owners to raise money uh, that would be used for um, enhancements into the downtown. And then building rooftop lighting. We have some building rooftop lighting, but um, we noticed that some areas were missing and there was opportunities to really light up the downtown and really um, make it seem uh, much more aesthetically pleasing. So parking highlights. We, uh, we spent a lot of time on parking because um, it seems to be a, a constant issue and a discussion around, is there enough parking in downtown? Right now, the downtown has really a healthy supply of parking. Over 2,000 parking spaces in public and private lots in the downtown core. It's, it's, it may not be on Monterey Street. It may not be right in, the, in front of the restaurant or the retail you want to go to, but there are 2,000 parking spaces in public and private lots. There's 400 on-street parking spaces. Downtown is walkable, so you can get anywhere within five minutes. Um, that is the measure of uh, if, if something's walkable. If you can get from one end of downtown to the other, uh, it is walkable. And it is. Um, I got long legs. I can probably do it in less than um, five minutes. But um, it down, our downtown is very walkable. Parking management plan offers a mechanism to manage parking long term. Um, so we do uh, have a strategy to looking at parking um, and trying to understand the use of parking in downtown. Uh, we have used about 20 parking spaces for the parklets and al fresco currently. Um, and then the long-term need for parklets and al fresco, maybe up to 33 spaces in total. As we look at um, who may be adding parklets uh, in the plan. Uh, so we're at 20 now. I think we may, I think um, it's actually 19 as of today. Uh, it may go down to 18, but it could go as high back up to 30. Uh, 31 should um, the parklets uh, that we're looking at be added in the near future. And then the need for short-term parking. So uh, we've had restaurants request the need for short-term parking. Um, we've had uh, the working group talk about short-term parking for 
um, just drop off and pick up. And then we need to figure out how to solve for parking on the north side of town. Uh, the, the parking garage services really the uh, south side of town, um, but there's an opportunity for more parking in the north side of downtown. And then again, solve for more accessible spaces. And we're um, in, the, in the plan that I think we'll ultimately bring forward, we'll be talking about how do we do that and where do we do that. So the possible parking solutions that we talked about, obviously create short-term parking. Um, we were thinking about that and uh, we're, we've talked about how to do that on the side streets, not necessarily on Monterey. Uh, we think we need to identify loading zones as restaurants uh, and retail are bringing product in. Uh, we need to avoid people double parking and blocking the lane of traffic so we don't have loading zones um, currently. So we had some conversations about how to create loading zones. Add more parking in the north side. Uh, we do have the depot and First Street lot, but that may or may not be a long-term solution. There's supposed to be housing that's built on that lot at some point. Monterey and First Street lot is vacant. And then adding more accessible parking spaces in the north side. Uh, ensure the VTA lot remains available. That is the lot that's on the east side of the railroad tracks. Uh, and the suggestion was to maximize the use of the VTA lot for downtown employee parking, that there should be an initiative uh, to ask our downtown employees to actually park, to, park in the VTA lot, not in front of your business, and actually walk over to your place of business to open up parking for uh, patrons who would be coming to downtown. Uh, share the use of the courthouse lot. Uh, begin selective enforcement. Currently, one of the challenges we have in downtown is um, there may be a two-hour parking limit, but there's no enforcement in downtown. The, the police department is not doing any enforcement. And even if we do short-term parking and put up 20-minute parking, we would have to look at some level of enforcement um, to make sure that we're enforcing the parking that's occurring there. And then longer term, and this is much longer term, is consider residential parking permit program for on-street parking. Um, that is a longer term um, discussion. If we have many residents who park um, on the street or in the parking lot because they don't have parking where they live downtown. Some parking, uh, park let highlights. Um, the program was started in 2018. Um, obviously COVID-19 forced more outdoor dining. When the program was started in 2018, we didn't have any restaurants take advantage of the Parklet program. It wasn't until COVID uh, came and forced people into outdoor dining did uh, restaurants actually come and do formal park out, uh, Parklet uh, build outs. Um, the Parklet program requires a full build out. It re requires traffic safety devices or some type of barricade. Uh, it requires an encroachment permit, which the fee is currently waived, and that was uh, implemented because of COVID to encourage more outdoor dining. It requires an insurance policy, and it requires 10-day noticing. So if somebody does a parklet application, we do do a 10-day notice. We put up a notice and see if anybody has any issues with the parklet going in, into that area. And um, nine times out of 10, probably 10 times out of 10, we don't hear anything or we haven't heard anything in the past. Um, the Alfresco program was implemented uh, when COVID really hit and really the Alfresco program really is just, um, just it, it, it is a, a, a light version of the Parklet program. And it essentially says you can get an encroachment permit and you can put outdoor dining. Um, you gotta show proof of insurance, but um, you, there's other things you don't need to do it really is a, a parklet program light. Um, we're, we're slowly but surely trying to move away from just the Alfresco program, candidly. Um, but we did extend it through 2022 because just we're unsure of how long COVID is going to last. We're still seeing impacts um, to the restaurant industry. We're seeing spikes in cases again. And we want to make sure things are easy for restaurants. And candidly, we're not getting complaints about alfresco dining. So if it isn't broke, don't, don't try to fix it. But we will be looking at the Parklet program in alfresco in early 2022 and probably making some recommendations and working with the restaurants uh, on, on how we move more directly to the Parklet program. 
some considerations really we're, we're understanding and managing the loss of parking uh, as it relates to the parklet program. Looking at design options for parklets, uh, and you'll see some options uh, later in this presentation. Talk about the affordability. A full parklet cost can be as much as $60,000. And if you're a restaurant, that's a very uh, high cost, uh, price tag. Um, and then community parklets. So is there an opportunity to build a community parklet that's not assigned to a business? But then you have to think about how do you activate it? How do you maintain it? Um, who's responsible for um, taking care of it, et cetera. And then how to support retail activations? How do you use maybe that community parklet for retail activations? And then obviously the ongoing maintenance of parklets. Who's responsible for it, for the, for the parklets and how are they maintained? How do we make sure that we keep good aesthetics in downtown? So parklets, beautification solutions. We want well-designed parklets. We'll show you some design themes that we've uh, been presented by API. Uh, we're talking internally about parklet assistance programs, uh, the encourage formal sidewalk extension build outs. Um, so things are ADA accessible and then potentially build a community parklet. And again, that's a cost. So who pays for that? How do we pay for it? Around beautification, we've had lots of conversations about really what can we do on the beautification side? So the first and for foremost is how do we really improve downtown street maintenance and cleanliness? Looking at side street lighting, really, um, as you get closer to Depot Street, there's some concerns off Monterey around lighting. Um, increased tree maintenance for lighting, um, just keep maintaining lighting and trees. Uh, one of the ideas was on the beautification is to add the bollards at 1st, 2nd, 4th, and 5th Street. Uh, these are the same bollards that you see at 3rd Street and Monterey um, that are extended out towards the, the street and the sidewalk. Uh, it's a nice setback. It has, it has an opportunity that allows pedestrians to stand uh, behind the bollards before they cross the street. So it's both kind of a, an aesthetic improvement and also a safety improvement. Encourage planters and planting uh, in downtown. Replace trees, which um, tends to be uh, uh, a controversial topic when you talk about what trees to replace uh, and, what tre and what type of re uh, tree to replace it with. Uh, there's a discussion, the mural, the frontier, build, frontier building. Um, it's a, candidly, it's a little of an unsightly building, but could you put a mural on it to make it more uh, attractive and more aesthetically pleasing? A lot of conversation around the need to unclutter or remove things in the sidewalk or on the, uh, the downtown street. Um, there currently are um, buildup of brick planters in downtown where the trees are uh, in a, a planter that's about uh, 12 inches high. Um, the, the brick is chipping around those, so it's kind of a trip hazard. Um, there's some maintenance issues. Um, looking at kiosks, removing of some of the kiosks, looking at the tree planters, um, removing of orange barricades and putting up a different type of barricade. Um, and then obviously the trees, the honey locusts or black locusts that even though they're alive and well, they don't look necessarily alive and well. And then um, add gateway art. So is there a way to do some type of gateway art that really beautifies downtown? So here are the, just a graphic of some things uh, that we talked about and I, I don't um, want to repeat it, but you can see the graphic. It's, we've spent some time, uh, we're actually going to have a brainstorming session today to think about what things that we can really implement um, on the beautification side. So let's get to the, the meat and the potatoes of um, why you're probably here, and that's the traffic highlights and really focusing on lane um, re reduction. Um, on the high level, traffic congestion is here and it's likely only to get worse. And that's the general um, traffic is never going to necessarily get better. We have more residents coming to town. We have more businesses coming to town. Um, we understand there is a need for traffic and congestion management. Um, there are limited opportunities to improve congestion. Um, there are only a certain number of things that we can do. Uh, we're in a city that's fairly built out, so there, there are a limited number of things you can do. Um, the Hale Avenue expansion will help. We really realize that. We understand that. And it's to be completed by the end of 2023, but it's a big project. 
um, and we hope we can stay on schedule with that. Freeway expansion, uh, the expansion of 101, both north and south, mainly south. Uh, obviously, it's, it's in the pipeline, it's in uh, the, the master transportation plan, uh, but we need to advocate for the funding and really try to push on getting that done sooner than later. Uh, the challenge is where Morgan Hill sits and the, the, the freeway narrows, it forces a lot of traffic, obviously, into Morgan Hill to bypass the freeway and try to get around it. Downtown lane reduction will make downtown safer by slowing down cars and making crossings safer. And then the city can invest in signal synchronization and other improvements to, um, to alleviate the impact of the, of the lane reduction. So we, Chris uh, Gioni has really done a, a deep dive on uh, traffic signal light synchronization on Butterfield. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but we do believe there can be some significant investment made, um, significant enhancements on the on Butterfield to alleviate any impact of a lane reduction. So the possible traffic solutions synchronize the single signals along Butterfield. Right now, there is no uh, synchronization of the signals in town at all. So the idea would be to really make Butterfield the, the bypass. It already is supposed to be the bypass for Monterey, but by synchronizing the lights and allowing traffic to flow more freely on Butterfield would encourage more traffic, more, uh, more folks to use Butterfield as the bypass. Uh, when you're heading south on Monterey and you come down Monterey and you want to get over, over to Butterfield, the idea would be to prioritize the left turn onto Cochrane off of Monterey and then the right turn onto Butterfield. Um, so we would add some synchronization there that would prioritize that left turn and then the right turn on Butterfield and then add a second right-hand turn on Cochrane at Butterfield. So traffic would flow more freely off of Monterey and into um, onto Butterfield. We would install in uh, educational signage. So if you're driving through town, use the bypass, use Butterfield. Um, there's an opportunity as well to improve visibility along Main Avenue at Monterey, at Del Monte, and at Depot. Those are things that we're working on now, um, just that would allow traffic to move smoother and be uh, uh, improve the safety. Uh, the need to enforce speeding the need to enforce noise, uh, big trucks. Um, trucks should not be moving uh, through downtown unless they're delivering in downtown, but make sure that we are clearly identifying the truck route, which is Butterfield, and then trying to prevent the rolling stop signs uh, that, that occur in downtown. Um, extend the lane reduction on Monterey Road north of Main Avenue to continue the bike lane and create diagonal parking. That was an idea that came up late in the process. We haven't spent a lot of time on it and it's not part of the proposed lane reduction, but it was an idea that came up. Um, traffic when you're moving south on Monterey does go from two lanes to one lane as you come underneath the train trestle and then it opens back up again to two lanes. So that's the conversation that came up is what if you just kept it at one lane the entire time? coming through downtown since you've already gone through the lane reduction. So here is how the lane reduction would be implemented. Um, you can see the, the, the rubber bumper. Um, it's a safety um, rubber safety hump. Um, they would be installed uh, on, in the roadway that then creates a five and a half foot wide bike lane. Uh, here, you can see my cursor. Um, you can see a design here um, where the lane reduction occurs, uh, single lane on Monterey Road, the, the safety bumps, and then the pedestrian bike lane here. And um, parking uh, may or may not be prohibited there. Um, this is, it just shows that it's probably where a parklet would go. Um, but you can see um, there'll be a couple other graphics that will show the actual implementation of the plan. Um, here is the lane re uh, dedu reduction plan for Monterey and Main Avenues. So we would do improved bicycle striping, uh, the, the green lane striping, 
Uh, you can see Monterey Road here. It's going um, at coming is approaching Dunn Avenue. It's two lanes here. You approach Dunn heading north. You have a left turn lane. You have a sig uh, single lane going uh, north uh, here. You have a right turn lane, and then you have a, a bike lane here in the middle. And then as you cross Dunn into uh, across on the Monterey, you have a single lane of traffic heading north, and you have a, a bike lane here, protected uh, bike lane. You can see that. Here's additional, um, the bike lane design. The bike lane will not be shared with cars to improve safety and maximize bike use. Cars turning will have to wait for um, bicyclists to pass. So this would be at 4th Street where you have a single lane moving north, a left turn lane onto 4th Avenue. And this is a shared lane, a bicycle lane. So if there's a bicyclist here and somebody wants to go right, they're gonna have to wait for the, the light to turn green to turn right. And then you can see moving north, the bike lane, the buffer, and then the single lane of traffic. So the traffic solutions, synchronized signals along Butterfield, the first and uh, most uh, important thing to go do, add a second left turn lane and prioritize the left turn at uh, Cochrane and Butterfield to make sure traffic is flowing uh, better south. Uh, install educational signage and then improve visibility along Main Avenue at Monterey, Del Monte, and Depot. And one of the most busy uh, signals in town is at Monterey and Maine. We don't have a lot of opportunities to make a lot of improvements there because of um, just how narrow uh, the passage is moving east and west. So it's very difficult to make any improvements there with the Wells Park, just the way that the buildings are so close to the street there. So um, here's some interfacing, uh, some examples. These are from API, and uh, it's just some examples of how the Parklet program could potentially be implemented. Um, these are concepts. We haven't decided on an exact um, design yet, uh, but these are designs that have been used in some communities and some designs that API have put together. So this is an interface option, uh, the agricultural influence. As you're looking at design elements, you're looking at like a, a planner, a, a tin planner, um, wine barrels, a wood type bollard um, that's got its steel reinforced, but it's wood on the outside. The siding and railing is either um, a grate or it's the aluminum or the tin. And then, um, the, the decking system that goes from the curb out into the street is kind of a wood uh, flare. And then the implementation of it looks something like this. And then you can see the, the single lane of traffic, the buffer zone, and then the, the bike lane. I will say um, we do show the green striped bike lane. Uh, we do not have a budget to green stripe our bike lanes. Um, it's very expensive to do that. Um, it's not in, uh, it, it, and then once you paint it green, it's very expensive to maintain it because you got to come back every two years, I believe, and repaint it. Um, but it does look really nice. So it'd be great if we could figure out how to do that. Um, here's a, that same agricultural influence example. Hey, uh, Nick, this is in front of Craft Roots. So it gives you an idea of what you could do in front of Craft Roots with a, with a parklet there. And another interface, and this is that um, just north of the hill um, and how you'd interface. And this is the potential future site of Sushi Confidential. So this is a historical influence. Um, this one just uses really a bollard and chain, uh, the stamped concrete. This is how it looks. Um, we don't love this design. I almost took it out of this presentation because we don't feel like it provides any other than the bollards, um, which provide great vehicle safety. Um, but it doesn't, you know, if you got a little kid with you or a dog, they can very easily get underneath the, the chain and into, into the pedestrian or into the bike lane and into traffic. So we don't love this design, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, 
but you can see the implementation. Here's an industrial influence. Um, it's more of a wood approach, wood and um, metal approach. Um, also with um, concrete planners, uh, has a different approach with concrete planners, uh, with more modern looking uh, bollards, some railing, and then maybe a concrete pad that's got a salt finish on it. It's um, instead of just doing a, a raised and an elevated pad with wood, that you'd actually pour concrete um, into the as the as the base to bring it level with the sidewalk. This is what it looks like. This is pretty close to what Los Gatos is using with a lot of their parklets. Um, we do like this design probably better the, of all three. We like this design uh, better than the previous two. Um, it's aesthetically probably more pleasing and it allows for planting and uh, safety. It's a better view of that with the bollards, the planter boxes, the uh, great railing, the salt finished concrete. Excuse me, is there any way to make that full screen so we can maybe get a better look at it? Um, I don't think so. No? no. Okay. That's about as big as it's going to get. So again, um, it's uh, the challenge with any of these uh, parklets is um, they're expensive to build. So um, obviously we would love to have consistency within downtown to have all the parklets look the same. Um, but to um, implement this, a parklet that looks something like this um, is going to cost um, somewhere between, and, and we don't have complete figures yet, but somewhere between forty and $60,000 to build uh, for a two parking spot parklet. So it's not insignificant. And then you're going to have to wait for materials anywhere from uh, three to four months for materials currently. So um, the outreach we've done, we've done four working group meetings, um, a lot of discussion, um, and then community-wide engagements. Uh, we've done a lot of community-wide engagement, and we are coming, we were originally scheduled to go to the city council on December, um, uh, when is that? The last meeting the next week, I guess it's next Wednesday we're supposed to go, but we pushed it to January, because we're still looking at cost estimates. We're looking at some design implementation. Um, we're still thinking through some beautification suggestions. And we also want to give the community time to react to the actual recommendations that come forward. And those should be coming forward in early January. Uh, city, The city staff, we go on furlough on December 23rd. And we'll be back on January 3rd. So um, that's about the time frame the staff recommendations will be coming out. And then there's a city council meeting scheduled for the 19th of January. That is the presentation. And I'm open for questions and comments. Alex. Thank you. Yeah. Boy, that's as thorough as, as anything that the city has ever done uh, for any project, it seems. Congratulations. And it looks like it could work. I guess my, my question really has to do with the timing which you've touched on, uh, which um, one factor is the completion of the hail extension. Um, what other time frames can you provide us today? So that's, um, that's the known factor right now is, well, it's known and unknown, right? We, we're, we're targeting for 2023 for the Hale Avenue extension. The other big traffic, um, potential traffic impediment in downtown will be the, the movement of Depot Street to Church Street. So when the Latala Hale Lumber Yard is built out, you're gonna have a major construction project there at the, the Hale Lumber Yard uh, and the realignment of Depot Street. Um, that project, we hope, will be underway um, spring, early summer of next year, um, but that's probably an 18 month project. Um, and we recognize that's gonna have some impact um, just in the downtown core. Um, and there's also a significant um, sewer project um, that's planned um, going down, I think it's Fifth Street, um, if I have that right, that's planned um, for next year. Um, that will cause disruption in the downtown core as well. 
Um, so those are the big traffic potential projects that are coming to the downtown. Um, but really the implementation, the synchronization of Butterfield can be implemented. Um, it's not inexpensive. It's, um, it's $100,000, $150,000 to go implement um, the synchronization, uh, which, you know, it, it seemed inexpensive. It's like, why haven't we done it before? Um, yeah. But um, it's the right thing to go do sooner than later and then get that, get that implemented um, right away. I think we've all concluded through the working group process that that's something we need to go do. Um, and then the rest of the implementation timeline, we have yet to decide on um, when that'll come out with a recommendation in the staff report in early January. Okay, Steve Tate. Yeah, I understand how it, everything will get safer on Monterey um, with the single lane. That That's kind of obvious, but what happened when we did the experimental program a few years ago was that people got off Monterey and that's where they started speeding up to figure out how to get around things uh, on Wright Avenue, on Main, on uh, even on, on First Street and, and Second Street. They'd get off and start speeding up to 60, 70 miles an hour to, to figure out a way around it. And is, is that been addressed, Matt, at all? The safety I think that's, of the people getting off Monterey? Yeah, I, I wasn't here during the, um, the uh, trial period that was done uh, previously, um, but I, I've heard that statement, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, former Mr. Mayor, um, once mayor, always mayor, by the way. Um, <laughs> I've heard that comment. That's why we do believe there needs to be increased enforcement. And that's been one of the conversations about just increased enforcement and increased presence um, by the Morgan Hill PD when this is implemented, um, because you do want to make sure there's increased enforcement in and around the downtown. Um, but that is a potential um, issue that we're going to be dealing with. Okay, thanks. Armando. Yes, thank you. Uh, Thank you for that, Matt. This right outstanding presentation. Thank you. That answered. By, by the way, uh, I appreciate the compliments on the presentation, but this has been. Um, I came into this project in the middle of it. I mean, my first days on the job four and four plus months ago were to go do business walks, and this has been a team effort with Edith and and Chris and Hillary. Um, really, a lot, a lot of staff time has gone into the outreach and the presentation yes. components of it. Um, because we recognize how important this is um, and how important it is to get right and to do the community outreach and to hear and gather feedback so we have a really good plan going forward. So I appreciate the compliments, but it's, it's, it's really been a team effort. Right, well, uh, thank you for that, Matt, and I appreciate the team effort from the Economic Development Group over at the city. They've done a, great, they've done a fantastic job in that. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned something about multiple features downtown for security. Can you tell me what those features are or what, you know, what we can mount on those for security? Yeah, the, the mountable feature is, uh, is actually the, the rubber uh, bumper that goes in the, between the, the car lane and the bike lane. It's, that's the mountable feature. It's that rubber that goes diagonally that's when they're talking about the mountable feature that it's, it goes in, it's mounted and it's easily, it can be removed. Um, and um, it can be replaced. Um, so that's what, what I'm talking about, the mountable feature. So this is Ellen Gates calling again. I left a message today, so we haven't heard back, but maybe I missed a phone call. My number is 408 9834 I'm calling in regards to our auto policy. Nick, you might want to mute. Somebody, uh, somebody should mute. Nick. But Nick, you have a question. Okay, any, any other questions? I guess one thing to follow up from Mayor Tate's question, uh, the side streets, and particularly I think the streets that are in parallel to Monterey, probably on the west side, any talk of putting any more stop signs to maybe slow down the traffic? Um, 
on that side of the community? Um, that wasn't talked about. Um, the challenge with, um, the, and we've talked about this, both adding stop signs on Monterey Road, but wherever you add stop signs, then you add, um, the, you, you slow down, one, you slow down traffic, which is great, but then you potentially create increased traffic congestion by traffic backing up. And then two, you create increased noise and opportunities to rev up engines, you know, as people rev up and go, um, you have the potential of adding noise, you know, big trucks, revving engines, motorcycles, revving engines, all of those things. Um, so that's a consideration when you're looking at adding stop signs. It may slow down traffic, but it may also increase congestion and increase noise. So again, it goes back to enforcement and um, people <laughs> being good citizens and driving the speed limit and um, following the rules of the road. Okay, Nick. There you go. Uh, thanks, Rick. First, I just wanted to, to thank you for the presentation again. It was, it was well done, Matt. Uh, and, I, and I just maybe want to say a couple of comments. First, uh, just we want to honor the process. It, uh, uh, this has been a, a very complicated uh, program to be thinking through. But if we if we if we just take a moment to reflect the amount of uh, impact that the community, the residents, the business owners, the property owners have really put forth to this date. I'm really hopeful that as we take this uh, issue to the city council in January, that we'll really come together with a long term plan that's scalable, is realistic, is measurable. And we continue the community advocacy efforts to ensure that both ownership and design and execution really can be met over a period of time. Again, this is really a one to many type of solution that we're working for. And you look at the stakeholders that are involved, it's, it's several, you've got business owners, property owners, you've got uh, downtown residents, you've got community at large. But what we're, what we're talking about here truly is a legacy decision that the city council has made as far as approving the, pro the program. I believe, if I understand this correctly, Matt, what we're bringing to the city council as far as a community voice is understanding the best way to implement, implement this program over a scalable time frame that makes sense, that's realistic for the greater community. And I just wanted to acknowledge that the process and the amount of work that's been done has been tremendous. I believe that the majority of these ideas, that as we look at scaling each one of these components, has, is, is a direct derivative of the amount of effort that the community has put forth to help the city understand what is reasonable and realistic to move this program forward. So I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that we should honor the process. We have much more work ahead, but as energies are now spent constructively looking at how best to implement the program on a long-term basis, I do believe this will be a successful program for Morgan Hill for decades to come. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Nick. Any other questions from anybody? Matt, definitely wanna thank you for your presentation. Uh, again, a lot of effort has gone into it, a lot of thought. Um, I do think that um, as we move forward and it's implemented in a thoughtful way, uh, hopefully that will prove to be a wonderful project for the city. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to um, allow me to come in and present on behalf of the Morgan Mill team. Um, we appreciate the chamber's engagement. Um, we look forward to hearing your comments uh, on the staff report that come forward and uh, welcome continued input and uh, appreciate several of you have participated in, in the working group and the town hall meetings. And um, it, it's just been it's really been a team effort bringing this thing forward. And so we look forward to uh, a culmination on January 19th at the city council meeting. Great, well, thank you. Um, any other reports we might have from the city or from Alex? Here, Alex, I actually, I'll have quite a bit to report after our, our um, board meeting tonight. So um, hang in there, I'll try to keep everybody informed and it's, uh, um, as, as you know, the, um, the city uh, of San Jose um, kept, uh, allowed the northern part of Coyote Valley to be, become ag, zoned ag versus, uh, ag, uh, versus um, commercial. And that's significant 
And the question is now what's going to happen with that land and how, how the landowners will be uh, treated. Uh, I, uh, I always feel that people who own land should be able to do what they, you know, their property rights should be able to do what they want with their land within certain boundaries. So um, hopefully they'll be part of that. And I hope, uh, I look forward to be able to tell you about it fairly soon. Well, thank you. Um, John McKay, anything to add from the city council? Um, uh, thank you. And by the way, thank you for the report, Matt. Um, I listened to everybody's comments. That was wonderful. Um, I think really the only thing to add, and I don't know if I, we talked about in this setting was that we, um, as a city, made donations to uh, different nonprofit organizations. And it, it's something that uh, we haven't really done in that manner. And it's something it looks like we're gonna try to continue doing uh, given proper resources. Um, but anyway, that was really, um, I think the one thing that stood out as far as what might be uh, economically involved besides everything we do involves <laughs> some money or some public funding in, in some manner. Um, anyway, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess the only other question I have is, Matt, have we heard of any um, tenants in the new uh, buildings that are going up on Butterfield? I can neither confirm nor deny okay. what, is, what is happening there. But um, if you see what's happening, um, they're getting closer to, yes, they um, to completion. Uh, the glass is in. They look, the glass looks really pretty cool. Um, the paint is next. They're finalizing the hardscape. I noticed this morning as I drove by, um, the hardscape is uh, going in and really taking shape. Um, they had a broker's open uh, a little over a month ago, really well attended. Um, a lot of, um, let me just say there's a lot of interest in Morgan Hill right now. Uh, so we're excited about that, um, both from a user perspective and from a real estate perspective. Um, so some good momentum. I think things are starting to break on the COVID front where people are looking at like future expansions now. Um, and candidly, there isn't this type of space available in the North County um, at the same rate of affordability that it potentially is in Morgan Hill. So we're excited about that. And then um, this morning as I drove in, I noticed this set seems like a little win, but the 7-Eleven in Evergreen is now open. So if you need gas or need a quick... Um, Pick me up. The Seven Eleven there is open now as of today. Hey, well, uh, Rick, hey, hey, Rick. Uh, yes. Before we go, uh, two of our attendees have questions: uh, Joe Mueller and Brian Sullivan. So I'm going to go ahead and allow them to ask their questions. Absolutely. Okay, we'll start with Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was just going to say, from a planning commission standpoint, we're no meeting the rest of the year. Uh, and I expect to start or at least see the schedule for the housing element uh, pretty early in January uh, because the uh, if you have I think everybody's already heard we have our final arena number and the appeals process is over so we can hopefully get started on finalizing that whole project and that uh, housing element is a really big project because it involves an update to master plans and to zoning codes in some cases uh, and in transportation. Other than that, I'm open to questions. Any questions for Jeff? Nope. Okay, I think Brian Sullivan had a question. There you go. Good morning all, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Matt. Uh, Matt, you weren't here some years ago when the San Jose Sharks was looking at moving uh, some of their facility to Morgan Hill. Um, it didn't work out that time. They are now talking to Gilroy. Is there any chance that we could get involved again and talk to them? Uh, you know, their, C their COO lives in Morgan Hill and uh, he loves Morgan Hill, um, but Gilroy reached out to him, I guess, and there's some negotiations going on, I understand, and they got a year or whatever to go through it or something. But, you know, is there a chance that we could reinvent and look at that? I know Steve Tate, you were involved back then um, as the mayor. 
Um, I have not inserted myself into that process. Um, I don't know if um, my boss has. Um, I'd be curious to learn more. Um, I know the folks at the Sharks really well. I'm happy to happy to reach out to them. Um, we try to play nice in the sandbox with the other local jurisdictions. So when somebody's in the middle of a project, um, we try not to poach. We try not to steal. We try to just play fair. Um, but um, there's no harm in um, always keeping all of our options open. And maybe if the Sharks are watching this presentation, um, they know how to reach me. But um, so we try not to poach, actively poach from other jurisdictions. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Is that it, Brian? Yes, thank you very much. And Matt, you had your hand back up. I did put my hand up because I would re be remiss if I didn't um, talk about this to this group. Um, we do have a, another significant project moving forward in the early part of January um, as it relates to city policy work um, that's been going on for a couple of years. So um, I'm going to I'm going to skip over the dates and just talk about generally the project. So um, a little, little less than a year ago, the city enacted a urgency ordinance, an industrial uh, ordinance, uh, industrial or urgency ordinance around distribution and warehousing. And um, that was in response to the Morgan Hill Responsible Growth Coalition's uh, potential uh, ballot initiative um, to address distribution and warehousing in the city of Morgan Hill. So the city enacted this urgency ordinance in April of last year. That urgency ordinance will be expiring in April of 2022. So to get in front of that, uh, we will be coming back to the planning commission in February uh, and then uh, the city council in March to permanently enact that ordinance um, that addresses um, the building type uh, we've already addressed the uses in the changes to the zoning code. So we'll, we will codify the ordinance on a permanent basis uh, early next year. The second piece of that is industrial preservation. Um, I'll be bringing forward a policy memo on, a, on the need to protect our industrial lands moving forward in the city of Morgan Hill. Uh, we wanna make sure we're preventing any future conversions of those lands. Uh, into either commercial or residential uses. Uh, that, that will also be going to the Planning Commission and the City Council. And then uh, side by side with that, we will be looking to address, and there's been two working groups or two working sessions uh, with the Planning Commission previously looking at zoning in industrial lands to reduce the number of CUPs, conditional uses, and uh, incompatible uses within industrial lands. So we'll be bringing forth some zoning code changes that limit, uh, significantly limit, prohibit the use of some conditional uses within the heavy industrial and limit the uses within just the general industrial lands um, to make sure that we're uh, protecting those industrial lands for jobs uh, moving forward. And the last piece is there will also be um, within that, uh, the opportunity to open up the use for medical use, medical office, within some of the light industrial lands as well. We have a significant demand for medical use within the city. Uh, and there already is some medical use within some PDs within the industrial zones, but we need the opportunity to open that, open that up a little bit because we're simply, we simply don't have built space uh, and the opportunity for some of these medical users to come into the city of Morgan Hill, specifically metal, medical office um, and professional office. So we're going to open, try to open that up a little bit. And the idea behind all of this is really just to match the, it's a supply and demand issue around the employment plan. So we're trying to create some alignment uh, while at the same time, open, protect the industrial lands moving forward for employment only. Um, obviously the group's impacted by that community assembly and indoor recreation. So we're going to try to clean that up and really protect the industrial lands for jobs moving forward because we're running, we're going to run out of industrial lands at some point. So that's that's coming forward. We'll probably come back to this group in January, I think, for the formal presentation, um, and we'll we'll line that up. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Any other questions or comments from the group? Well, if not, thank you everybody for attending and we will see you in January. Happy holidays, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, guys. Yeah. Thank you.